here and and uh, so many other related concepts. And, 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 and I think also, ladies and gentlemen, it's a bit of patience involved, a good deal of humility, and, and, and then a specific kind of humility as it relates to submissiveness. So my subject this morning is stay on the wheel. Stay on the wheel. When, when, when Jeremiah went down to the potter's house in verse 3, he says, behold, he wrought, meaning the potter, wrought a work on the wheels. And having to do with the potter's wheel and, and how he formed what he was dealing with there and making it the vessel of his design. So the Lord is talking to us today about staying on the wheel. So I want to begin with, uh, if I were really in, in, in the way of having a lot of time to flesh this out, I would talk to you quite a bit about the sovereignty of God and the fact that God is absolute in, absolutely in charge. He is sovereign. He uh, needs nothing and he doesn't need anybody's okay. He doesn't need anybody's permission to do whatever it is he decides to do. He is God and he does what he will. And, and because of that then, that we then, being God's people, we have been uniquely shaped and formed by him, that we belong to him. And so uh, when I'm developing this lesson, even some time ago, I realized that as we are his creation, we are his. But then even further, when we, by choice and by freedom of will, we enter into relationship with him, we are even the more so his. So he says to my heart, that you are his by uh, creative design, and you are his in terms of a unique relationship uh, that you have with him. He doesn't have that kind of relationship with anything or anybody else other than his people. And as part of that uniqueness, we are exclusively his, meaning we don't belong to anybody else. There's nothing else that can lay claim to my life, including me, but God himself. Amen. And so because of that, then we enter into that relationship by reason of his grace. And uh, that grace has made it possible for us to be saved. But it is our faith that gives us access into that grace. Amen. So Romans chapter 5, verse number 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So it is as though grace is that whole uh, area that God has carved out for us, that place of undeserved, or unmerited favor. But it is faith that gives us access into it. It's faith that allows us to make entry. And so by reason of that confidence that Elder Phelps so beautifully taught about this morning, we have access into the grace of God. But this is only the beginning. This is where we start out. There is that saving faith. Amen. That faith that we apply when we acknowledge that we need a Savior and only Jesus has gotten the job done. I notice I didn't say can get it done. It's already been done. Amen. And only he has gotten it done. And so by reason of what he's already done, he allows me to have saving faith. But he says, now, I don't want you to just stop there. I want you to go on from faith to faith. So my, my, my plan in your life entails in the great measure of building that faith. The more you learn about me, the more you know about me, the greater your faith will be. The greater your faith, the greater your confidence. The greater your confidence, the greater your clarity, as we heard this morning. And God is going to lift us from faith to faith. So, so David says in Psalms 31, verse number 15, he says, My times are in thine hands. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from them that persecute me. Notice he was not telling us that we are not going to have problems. 
and that we're not going to have enemies and that we're not going to have persecutors and haters. We are indeed. But he said, when that happens, I know what to do. Amen. My times are in your hands. Amen. Amen. And he says in another place, amen, that what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. So God is letting us know that we have that relationship with him, but it's on the basis of our faith. And so we then ask God to work on us. We recognize we need God to work on us, that even when he accepts us into the beloved, that we are not all that we ought to be, that God has a great project ahead in making us conformable to the will of God. And because of that, we need the Lord to work on us. If I can just interject this just by the way, I had a little bit of something I was wrestling with in my mind because a careful reading of the text indicates that the Lord is speaking to Israel. And Israel, of course, is a country, is a nation, and more specifically to Judah, that part that remained after the uh, ten northern tribes had left and seceded and then was overwhelmed by Assyria. And, and yet what was left was Judah. And, and yet, so this was a body of believers. And so I'm saying, Lord, what part of this goes to the body and what part of this belongs to me as an individual? And God says, well, one thing is directly connected to the other and they are inseparable. It is like the church and you as a member of the church. And I need to say that because there are some of us today who feel like the church as a body is disposable that we hear precious little about God's dealing with his body. And I want you to know that God has not abandoned his body. He's coming back for a church. Thank God he's not just coming back for you by yourself or me by myself. He's coming back for all who are in his church. Amen. And so my part in that is to be involved in and be part of that body. And as being part of that body, then what he says to the body not only applies to the body, but it applies to me as being part of the body. Amen. So when the Lord says to, to Israel, don't you know that I am the potter and you are the clay? He's not just talking to the nation or to the church at large, but he's also talking to me as a private individual. And so because I now know this, I can proceed a little bit further in my knowledge of God. I can understand that because we believe in him and know that everything he's doing is right, I then must willingly submit. Submission has become a bad word in our culture. We find it very difficult to yield ourselves to somebody else's authority. But brothers and sisters, when it comes down to God, that's exactly where it needs to be. But God is not telling us, I want you to submit out of a vacuum. God is saying, look at who I am. Look at who, what I've already done. As we talked about in Sunday school this morning, check my record out. Amen. And you'll see I have never faltered and I have never failed. That what I promise, I am able also to perform it. And all you have to do is to walk with me in confidence and trust. And if you yield yourself to me with that, even though you go through the fire, it shall not be burned upon you. When you walk through the flood, it shall not overwhelm you. God says, I'm going to bring you out better than you were coming in. All you've got to do is keep your trust in me. And that trust is made manifest in submission. Let me just pause right here to make certain we are all clear. That submission means that when you hear and know the word and the will of God, you have no problem with obeying it. I read something very lovely in the study about this, and it said, to command God is to obey God. Mm -hmm. In other words, if we want something from him, the way we get that is by obeying him. 
My God, I read that, Lord. I hear that in my spirit, that, that this is how I please God. This is how I flow in concert with him, is by being obedient to what thus saith the Lord. Even when it hurts, I need to understand it's still for my good. It's what's best for me. Yes, sometimes it may not be according to my good pleasure. It may not float my boat. It may not meet the parameters of my comfort zone. But God says, if you can just still obey me, if you can still submit to me, if you can still trust me, it's going to be better for you. Yes, for all things. Let me back it up a half step. We know that all things work together for the good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. God says he already knows the way that we take. He knows what we think. He knows how we feel. He has pre-examined every trial and every test. He's looked at it from every possible perspective. And he says, I want you to understand that I wouldn't allow it to come upon your life if I didn't already already know. <laughs> Glory be to God that it was going to work out for your good. So, so now, if you look at the potter's house, uh, the Hebrew word is yatsar for potter, and it means especially one who uh, fashions out of the earth, and, and he forms things, and he's a framer, he's a maker. And, and the thing about the potter is, is that the potter, before he gets to even to the clay pit, he already has an understanding about what he wants to do. He already has a de design. So as I was m uh, m m meditating on that this morning, the Lord says, I don't depend on the clay to inspire me and give me an idea about what to do. I don't, I don't just, just pick up some clay and say, oh, okay, I can use it for this or that. He says, I already know what I want to do. The design is already here. The design is already seated in divine thought. And so God lets us know now by, by this analogy that you and I as human beings, we are the clay. Human life is represented by clay. Human life in the raw, in its unrefined sense. Uh, they tell me that this clay, when the potter would find it, uh, this word was chomer. And it meant uh, bubbling up. It meant of water and of earth. It meant miry, clay, cement. Uh, it was a heap, and hence a chomer of dry measure. And, and so when, when, when the potter would collect this stuff, there was no real uh, particularly redeeming value in it. But he had something in his mind. So he would take that sufficient amount of clay and he would take it and he would put it on the wheel. And as the wheel would spin around by the working of the pedals, he would take his hands and he would shape it into the desire that he had in his mind. Ladies and gentlemen, it is that turning process that I want you to somewhat focus on today. I can only imagine that that clay, if it had a mind, would say, my God, this is really dizzying. This is so confusing. Can you slow the pace down? Is there something you can do to make it a little easier? But he's spinning it on the wheel. And, and all the clay has to do is stay under the potter's hand. Can I tell you and I today that that's what God is calling for you and me is to stay under the potter's hand. Just let him work what he's working. Let him do what he's doing and let him continue to fashion us under the skill of his own hands. Ladies and gentlemen, the text suggests that the potter found that there was a mar something that marred the clay. Maybe there was a stone in it or maybe there was something that by the time he had got it to form like he wanted to, it still wasn't quite right. And what did the potter do but to take that clay and, and pound it back into its original shape and start all over again? 
I don't know if you can feel that in your spirit today, but sometimes that's what he does with us. He finds some kind of imperfection, something that comes short of his divine purpose and his holy will, and he will start all over again with us. Thanks be unto God he doesn't throw us back into the pit from whence we came. Thanks be unto God he doesn't write us off and consign us to destruction, but he starts all over again, and he begins to spin us on the wheel and and to the extent that we stay submissive in our master's hand under the potter's direction he begins to form us and shape us into that thing that he had in mind even from before there was a world as i read a little bit further i find that not only does the potter shape that vessel into his desired form and do as he will with it he will then take a stylus or some sharp instrument and he will carve his name his initials or his sign into this vessel it will say to all who will come in contact with it from for future onward that this is mine it was made by me. I want you to know that when God does that to us, he's signing his name on your life and mine. Uh-huh. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 4 and 10, we are always bearing about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. We're not here to represent ourselves and to boast about what a vessel we are, but the fact is without him, we would still be just a mass of formless clay. But our God has put us on the wheel, and he shaped us, and now he put his name upon us. Can I go a little deeper with that? Can I tell you that sometimes he uses people to be his instrument he yeah he writes his name on us uh, using difficult people uh, you know people that's hard to get along with uh, people who may be obstinate uh, people who may be contrary uh, people who may be argumentative uh, people who may be racist uh, people who may be sexist uh, people who may be ageist uh, people who are discriminating based upon economy but God says, no matter, I'm writing my name using them as my stencil. They don't really realize it. They think they're putting you down. They think by digging into you, they are somehow hurting you. But they don't really understand. They're just making the life of Jesus more manifested in me. So that when people see me, the first thing they're going to know is who made you the... Oh! who made you this way who is it that shapes you who is it that formed you by what design have you come he says yes that's how it is that's what I do with all my people I put my name on them I, I let circumstances come that they would not find pleasing but I'm writing my name on them so that when folks say how is it that you're able to do it and how is it you're able to endure it and you tell them it's not by me, but look whose name I'm wearing. Yes, look to whom I belong. It's he that gives me the power. Then we are told that when he has fully formed that, that vessel and he's inscribed his name upon it, the next thing he does is he puts it in a kiln, which is an oven. And we are told that that oven is heated to 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty hot. And this causes that vessel to develop a finish. It also causes the vessel to harden. Its pores begin to shrink, causing the vessel to become smaller, making it no doubt, as it were us, to think not so highly of ourselves, to recognize, oh God, I must decrease that you might increase. Uh, 
Trials make us think less of our ability and yet more of his. More about the God that's able to do exceeding and abundantly above anything that I can ask or anything that I can think. More about the God to whom there is no barriers, who can do all things and do them exceedingly well. More, more about the God to whom the word impossible does not even exist and is not in his vocabulary. For all things are possible to them that trust in him. Our divine deliverer, our divine potter also knows that we are going to suffer in life. But God says it's just your time in the kiln. The writer in Psalms 119.71 says, It was good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. And again in Psalms 34.19, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered him out of them all. Don't you realize we're just getting the finish put on us. God is allowing us to go through these hot and torturous conditions only that when we come forth we'll come forth like pure gold so at the moment that he takes us out of the oven and we are allowed to cool now now we are prepared for the master's service now the Lord can use us any way he wants to use us I hear us sometimes say Lord use me use me in your service but are you willing to stay on the wheel are you willing to let him shape you are you willing to let him write his name on you are you willing to let him finish you God says all these things are required if you're going to be used by my hand and so the potter knows just how much we can bear the potter knows what our limitations are but we are on divine assignment. The potter is fulfilling that purpose for which we were made in the first place. Saints, we are his. We don't belong to ourselves. It's not up to us anymore to chart our own path and talk about what we want and what we will and what we will not do because we are his. We belong without reservation to the God of our salvation. So we must stay under his hand. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We are not living to our pleasure or to our design, but we want him to get the glory. When folks see us, and talk about what a beautiful vessel, uh, a vessel unto honor uh, your life has become uh, and my life has become. Uh, we must be careful to let them know uh, that it's not by might, uh, it's not by power, uh, but it's by my spirit, uh, said the Lord. Uh, we are what we are uh, by the grace of God. And he who had begun a good work in me, uh, he is going to perform it uh, unto the day of Jesus Christ. Uh, so I rise today to tell us, uh, stay on the wheel. Uh, stay on the wheel. Uh, don't let the pandemic uh, make you get off the wheel. Uh, don't let panic set in uh, and begin to tell you what to do. Uh, don't let fear begin to drive you uh, and say, I'll never take the vaccine. I'm scared of it. Uh, fear has to moment but God says I don't want you to walk in that I have not given you the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind is there a witness in the house today God says stay on the wheel stay on the wheel stay on the wheel you may not like what you're feeling right now but you know what he never asked us to approve it he never asked us how do we feel as though that were a reason for us to jump off the wheel God says I want you to stay on the wheel I'm working it out I'm just taking a little bit off here 
and I'm adding a little bit on there. I'm making you what I want you to be. I'm fulfilling that purpose for which I apprehended you in the first place when I saw you and you were nothing but I had something in my mind that I knew you could be. If you just let me have my way I'll make you into a vessel of honor. I'll make you a vessel unto pleasing and I'll make you a vessel unto my glory. I wonder today is that your heart's desire. Lord make me a vessel that's for your glory. I want to be pleasing in your sight. I want you to get the glory. I want you to get the honor. I want people when they see me they say there you go with Jesus on his mind. That's one of his. That's one of his. He belongs to the Lord. Don't touch him. Leave your hands off of him. That's God's child. Oh, is there a witness in the room today? Hallelujah. But the Lord says, stay on the wheel. Somebody holler back, stay on the wheel. I can't hear you. Stay on the wheel. Stay on the wheel. Stay on the wheel. Stay on the wheel. God is working it. God is doing it. Don't get mad at other folk. Don't get stressed out by other folks. Don't become reactionary to other folk. But God says, stay on the wheel. You can go through this. You can make it through this. You will be better. This is not come to destroy you. It's just come to make you stronger and for me to use you for my glory. So the other day, when we were in our Thursday Bible class, and we had been talking about the 23rd Psalm, and we were dealing with the verse where the psalmist says, Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. And the writer said, as he began to pray, he said, Lord, first of all, that surely is just overwhelmingly powerful. Absolutely. Without controversy. My God goodness and mercy which the writer interpreted as God's love was going to be with him all the days of his life and when you have that kind of confidence that kind of revelation then what can man do unto you but he said Lord as the psalmist says in another place what shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits toward me. He said, how can I pay you for all of this that goodness and mercy should follow me all the days of my life? And so the Lord created an image. He said, when that sheep moves along and has been so blessed and so anointed, he leaves behind trails, footprints that are filled with that substance of anointing, that substance of goodness, that substance of mercy. He says, that's the way I want you to be. I want you to leave a legacy of goodness and mercy. I want it to be known that wherever you go, you leave behind you a trail of goodness and mercy. I want people to be able to look at your life and see the goodness of God, the mercy of God. I want them to be able to know that this is the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes. Brothers and sisters, he went on to say that we do that by sharing that goodness and that mercy to other people. As good as God has been to us, we've got to be that good to other people. As merciful, glory to Jesus, as God has been to us, we've got to be merciful. Oh, my Lord. Did, did you get the message that mercy is what arises in the face of offense? When your natural man 
wants revenge. But your spirit man says, give him mercy instead. Why? Because goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life. That's what marks your trail. That's what identifies you. It is his name, his, his, his calling card. Goodness and mercy follows you all the days of your life. God says, that's the way I want you to be. But in order to get there, we've got to stay on the wheel. We've got to stay on the wheel. And he's coming. He's, he's going to test us. He's going to allow us to be tested in times and moments that we did not anticipate. Closing, one Abigail A. Pollard penned the words of a very familiar song. And part of it says, have thine own way, O Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, patient and still, God says, stay on the wheel. Stay on the wheel. Don't jump off the wheel. Even if you see others doing it, don't you do it. You stay on the wheel. I know the way that you take. And I know what I'm doing in your life. Give God a hand and praise. For those of us who are here, it seems that everybody here has a profession of faith and a relationship with the Lord. For that, I'm well pleased. However, if you need prayer today, I want you to just raise your hand. We're going to pray especially for you. Pray especially for you. God bless 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 you on this side. Thank God for you. God bless you and thank God for you. And Elder Phelps, if you would do that and pray for us, Deb also over on the other side behind you, and uh, Deacon James and Evangelist Meandre, I'll pray for them as well. Saints, yes, these are trying times. Yes, we're enduring conditions we've never endured before, but our God is faithful. Our God is faithful. And he hasn't developed some kind of amnesia that he doesn't know where we are. He knows us. He knows us. He knows where we are. He knows what we're going through. He knows how we think and how we feel. But God says, I am with you. And as the scriptures tells us again, if God be for us, he's more than all the world can ever be against us. God bless you today. Stay on the wheel. Amen. Before we receive our announcements, we are going to have a word of prayer uh, concerning those who have raised their hands. Amen. Let us join together in prayer in Jesus' name. Father God, we thank you. Lord God, and we praise you. We give you glory. We give you honor, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, for you are good, and you're good all the time. Father, we're just so grateful, Lord, to have relationship with you today we're so grateful oh god to have access to you lord in the name of jesus that we can come boldly before your throne of grace oh god that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help us in the times of our need father we're praying today oh god for your people lord and we're so grateful that you are a god who knows all things your word tells us that you know what we have need of even before we ask. But, oh God, it's as though you expect us still to ask, even though you know. Father, that we might demonstrate our faith in you in the name of Jesus. So, Father, we have come, Lord, asking that you would bless in each of these situations according to the need in the name of Jesus. Father, we're praying, oh God, that you would encourage the hearts of your people, 
that while we're going through whatever the situation is, that we remain faithful to you, that we remain confident. Your word says, cast not away therefore your confidence, for it hath great recompense of reward. Help us, I pray, to hold on to confidence, Lord, whereby, O oh God, your will becomes more clear to us what you're doing and what you're up to. Father, we thank you for the word that we received on today, O oh God, and Father, how that you've given us the understanding, Lord God, that when you may have to, when you see an imperfection, you may have to start over with us again. Father, we're grateful, Lord, that you don't throw us away. You still see the diamond in the rough. Hey, glory, hallelujah. In us. And Lord, you're working us through them. And Father, we're just praying that you would help us to hold on in the name of Jesus until the end, being confident, oh God that you will make it all well in the end. We'll give you glory, we'll give you honor, and we'll give you praise even now. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Give the Lord a hand, praise. Hallelujah. Stay on the wheel. Stay on the wheel. In Jesus' name, at this time, we shall receive our announcements coming up this week. To tomorrow evening, we will have our normal Monday night prayer, which begins at 6.30 p.m. by way of the conference line. Amen. We also, we're going to have a minister's meeting uh, at 7.30 p.m. by way of Zoom. Amen. Please check your emails if you are one of the ministers. Amen. We will have Bible class 7 p.m. on Wednesday by way of Facebook Live. Please join us there on Thursdays. The mothers, the O'Fallon Apostolic Assembly Mothers Board have the Bible class at 6.30 p.m. They also do that by way of a conference line, amen. And on Saturday, Saturday there will be a sister-to-sister -sister, uh, women's conference. Uh, I'm assuming that that's gonna be uh, hosted down in Georgia. Amen. The time frame for that will be 9 a.m. to 12 noon. Amen. Please contact. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, Sister Phelps. <laughs> Amen. That's my wife, Sister Veronica. Amen. Please contact her uh, for information regarding that. We are on Facebook. We're asking that you would like us on Facebook. Please follow us on YouTube. Amen. We have our services recorded there. Our address and our email is O'Fallon Apostolic Assembly. Oh, I'm sorry, O'Fallon Apostolic at gmail.com. The website is O'Fallon Apostolic.org. Our phone number is 618 632 9377. Our mailing address is 403 South Lincoln Avenue, O'Fallon, Illinois 62269. Amen, amen. We have various ways of giving. Uh, some have come by and left their blessings in the mail slot. We have online giving opportunities. We are on Givelify. Also, you can uh, give by PayPal through the website. Amen. Please be a blessing to the ministry. And we ask that each of you have a great week in Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. In Jesus' name, Deacon Ray Anthony is standing to my...